Welcome back to Spacey on the Right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. And happy Friday to you. Really glad to be with you today. I'm really glad it's Friday. The weekend is upon us. So good to have a little bit of time to recharge and disconnect from all of our political information. But right now, it's my pleasure to welcome Jonathan Coppage, Senior Fellow at R Street Institute. He's a former senior editor for the American Conservative. Jonathan, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. So um, I see that the topic is about conservative urbanism impacting poor and impoverished communities. And I am just, I'm chomping at the bit. I want to hear what this is about. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's good to, it's always good to talk about this stuff. Um, You know, I work on specifically this issue of conservative urbanism um, because of the research that I've done into the history of our, the way that our country has been put together and the way that we regulated ourselves. And what I found is that there's a great tradition of ways in which um, we as Americans have been oriented towards each other and supporting each other, uh, both as families and as communities that were actually built into the ways in which we lived. Um, They were built into ways that families could live across generations and neighbors could be oriented towards being able to lean upon each other. And um, in sort of the post-war period, we had an opportunity to sort of spread out a bit, get our elbow room, um, but we unfortunately in a lot of ways turned away from... uh, sort of the traditional built environments that let us support each other. And so that meant that when we fell on hard times um, and no longer had uh, those built supports, there was a lot further to fall. Mm. And these kind of supports, are you saying that the kind of suburbanization of our culture contributed to the end of those supports, or, or is it that it's because we're so far away from each other that we can't access them, or, you know? Right. Um, this this uh, took place very much in line with suburbanization. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, but those trends all sort of set up at the same time. Um, one of the big things that I've done research into is specifically uh, multi-generational households. You know, being able to have uh, what was literally called the mother-in-law suite, <laughs> the granny flat, <laughs> being able to build a house where, um, you know, as your parents got older, they could move in with you and help you out with the kids. Or uh, when your kids came back from college, they could uh, stay with you a little bit as they built up a nest egg, but they wouldn't have to be on top of you to drive things a little crazy. And during, uh, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, we just passed a lot of zoning codes that were only focused around this one stage of life when you had one family with little kids. And as people go through different stages of life, they now have fewer and fewer, um, you know, opportunities to access things that fit them. And so what a lot of my work is built around is trying to get people uh, to be able to build that again, to be able to build a separate uh, suite, to be able to, um, you know, build traditionally so that you can have strong communities that are resilient in times of hardship. Okay, so this is kind of fascinating because, and I don't know if you found this in in your research, but I know here specifically, um, we've actually discussed it at the book club that I'm a part of. It's it's been a conversation. And it's also, I feel like, has has kind of bubbled up a little bit nationally, but not as like, it's not something you're seeing on, you know, NBC or the Today Show, which is that a lot of our immigrant families actually still live in the way that you're describing. So a much more traditional, Mm -hmm. older American type of a situation where they move in. So there, many of these immigrants are coming in. They're more affluent. They are well-educated and they purchase homes in suburban areas, I'm thinking of one specific area right here in the St. Louis metro, where they'll buy more than one house on a cul-de-sac or in a subdivision, and they'll live near family members, extended family. And then the parents almost always live with the adult kids, 
And then when the kids' <laughs> children get to college age, they do, as you've described, move back home and live at home for a while as they work and establish their career and save money for a down payment on a house, which they then again purchase within, you know, like a four mile radius of the original home where their parents live and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is absolutely something that we found is that immigrants um, far and away have a much higher attachment to these traditional living models, you know, which makes sense because they're often coming from places where these models still exist. And there's a reason why the models were found in the first place. It's very prudent. It's a good way to, um, you know, be able to compile wealth and social capital at the same time. And so you see this with poor immigrants. You see this with well-off immigrants. And in a lot of immigrant neighborhoods, you see people moving into bigger houses mm -hmm. or building additions because they know that's how they want to live. Um, and when you get into the literature, you find, you know, Americans are actually starting to live that way a lot more as well. Um, well, it was for being native born Americans, uh, bottomed out in about the early nineties in terms of that process of spreading themselves out and not living together. But over the past 20 years, we've been going back and back in that direction to where the multi-generational household rate now is about the same as it was in the 1940s. So I, I guess I, I think that's fantastic. I, I wouldn't have said the same maybe six or seven years ago because I kind of connected it to a sense that Americans weren't doing as well. And so kids were being forced to move back home and live in their parents' basements for 10 years because they couldn't find work. But I think there's something mm -hmm. that, that there's kind of a delineation that we need to make, which is if we're talking about the same thing that, that you're describing, people aren't moving back home because they're unsuccessful. They're moving home because it's a way for them to avoid renting and to consolidate those funds, which would then go towards their first home, which is a wealth building exercise that you want to do as early as possible. And also because the families mm -hmm. are more closely knit. So are, are you seeing some success with the zoning changes, because I think that's the, primarily uh, one of the things you either have to move far out where the zoning is much more friendly, or if you're in the metro area, you have to kind of find an area where the, maybe there's already a carriage house with a garage over it or, or mm -hmm. a carriage house with, you know, an apartment over it, something like that, where you don't feel like you can build it new, but it's already there and you have to kind of try to get to that instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of older places, a lot of places that were built by, say, the 20s or the 30s and before, they will have these already built in. You know, you'll have that carriage house, you'll have uh, the mother-in-law suite. But what is encouraging is that we're seeing a lot of places move towards being able to um, build these again. And a lot of places are looking specifically to loosen up their rules. I live here in Washington, D.C., and uh, Washington itself just passed a major reform recently in order to ease up the ability of people to, um, you know, make those additions. The entire state of California, actually, over the past few years, has been passing laws to make sure that local communities allow people to make these sort of investments in their homes. Because um, one of the other interesting things about them is that when you don't have families living together because they're not in that stage, having these sort of things built into a house gives you an opportunity to bring in a little bit more income. You can take in borders like mm -hmm. people have historically done in the United States. When your kids are in college, you can, you know, help. it can help you with that tuition a little bit to have some rent money coming in. And then when you have a need for it for your family, then you still have that available to you. Yeah, I love that. I think one of it's, well, I know some families here who have purchased rental property when their kids were in kindergarten. And the intention is that either their kids will live in it because it's near a college campus if they attend that college, or it will continue to be rented out and that income will help offset some of the college expenses. But I also, I, I know quite a few families who have a house that has either a fully finished basement within its own, you know, entrance and exit that you can come in and out of, 
that at some point, not only have their teenagers live there, but now they're kind of retrofitting it so their parents can move into it. And I just think it keeps us a little closer together. I wonder, is it that Americans are also beginning to recognize the strength that comes from the closer familial relations? I, I think so. I, I think so. I think we are starting to hit the point of having sort of moved apart and lived apart and um, almost idealized being independent and apart too far and are now starting to recover some of those wisdoms. Um, and that's going to take a lot of adjustments because, as you mentioned, one of the big concerns that people have is that people is that kids will move back, live rent free, not do anything. And my common response to that is, well, why let them? <laughs> you know, we have this idea that um, the relationship between parent and child should always be between that of a parent and you know, an elementary schooler, where every time they come in, they're totally dependent. Mm -hmm. You know, just the fact that you live together doesn't mean that you're not adults. And you have to live to, you know, learn to live with each other as adults. You can charge rent to your kids. You can set rules because it's your place. Um, but you should learn to live together as adults and, you know, encourage each other to be independent, full citizens who are self-supporting rather than one just being dependent on the other. I, I couldn't agree more. I think when, when when you were just describing that, I was seeing like a couple of our kids as toddlers and then I'm seeing them like I'm trying to imagine them as full grown adults. And I think we could probably all benefit from just saying, you know, just on the outset, the benefits outweigh the negatives. And if we could figure out a way to do it, it would mean closer knit families generationally, which we do need, mm -hmm. especially in these. It's kind of it's kind of turbulent. It's kind of really everything's fractured because of politics. A great way to kind of counterman that would be stronger families. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the way you're describing it and the changes that you're seeing, I, I think it's wonderful. It's really kind of good news, if you will. Absolutely. And so that's something that, you know, people can get involved in in their own communities of trying to, you know, talking to their city council, seeing if they have, they're called accessory dwelling units is the latest name for them, if they have rules for that. And then in their own families, thinking about how they relate to their parents and their kids and, you know, restoring that way of living together. Well, I think a great way to do it is, first of all, learn the new terminology, accessory dwelling units. Sounds kind of fancy. Um, and then, like you <laughs> said, finding out if your community allows that and if they don't, kind of... It, this isn't one of those ones where we have to be adversarial. It's simply an idea that can be brought forward to municipal leaders and kind of just say, look, this, this strengthens families. It, it, it increases property values. It's good for Americans. And then, you know, watch the change happen mm -hmm. gradually. Um, I'm so glad you're doing this work, the research and all of that to kind of bring this forward to people and, and put it into our thought processes for things we can do to help our local governments. And um, I look forward to talking to you again, Jonathan. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. All right. Happy weekend to you. Um, and he's a senior fellow at R Street Institute, Jonathan Coppage, former senior editor for the American Conservative. And it was a pleasure to get to speak with him today.